Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Julie Meller, and I'm going to chair this evening. I'm a, a trustee of Involve, um, which is the UK's leading charity on public participation, and we want to put public, the public's voice at the heart of decision-making. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, at the RSA to, uh, to chair this, this year's annual Chief Executive Lecture, which is always, I gather, a, a highlight of the Society's um, annual calendar. Before we begin, just can I ask you all to make sure your phones are on silent or off? Um, we're live streaming, so welcome to those of you who are uh, watching on the web-based version, um, joining us on online. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, then please do use hashtag RSA Democracy for any tweets. Um, we hope you will get involved because we want to kickstart a public conversation about our democracy at every level, the state it's in, and what can be done to strengthen it. The format for this evening is uh, Matthew will give his lecture and then we will be joined by two discussants. Cloda Harris, who's an academic at the forefront of extraordinary period of democratic uh, innovation in Ireland, and Tim Hughes, who's the director of Involve. Um, after that, there will be time for comments and questions, and because this is the RSA and it is the start of a campaign, um, we're going to end with an ask for all of you. Um, just by way of introduction, I, I, I see and feel the challenge that we face between elite democracy and populism, and it's that that brought me to the questions that Matthew's going to address tonight about what democracy needs now and the contribution that deliberative democracy can make. He said in one of his blogs, I don't know how many of you read his, his blogs in advance of coming tonight, but he said that he was going to give a lecture on the seemingly puny and dull sounding topic of deliberative democracy. So it's an unusual way to introduce his lecture, so I'm intrigued by what he's going to say. So could you, welcome, could you join me in welcoming Matthew to his annual lecture? Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you to the RSA team for their usual brilliant organization and to Involve uh, for working with us on this event. And to Cloda for coming all the way here from Ireland to add her first-hand experience. But most of all, thank you, Gareth Southgate, uh, for ensuring that it's tomorrow evening, not tonight, <laughs> that England resume their march to World Cup glory. Um, it's often said of democracy that it's great in principle, but sometimes terrible in practice, just like it used to be said of England that they were great on paper, but rubbish on grass. Um, <laughs> if the latter can be disproved, so perhaps can the former. In 1989, with the fall of the Berlin Wall still echoing, Francis Fukuyama prophesied the, glo <laughs> prophesied the global triumph of liberal democracy and the end of history. 30 years on, it's not history in jeopardy, but liberal democracy itself. China, the rising global power, is thriving with a system which combines economic freedom with political autocracy. There is the growth of what Yasha Monk calls illiberal democracies, countries with notionally free elections, but without the liberal foundations of accountability, civil liberties, and cultural openness. The issue with nations like Russia, Hungary and Turkey and those exhibiting a backlash against liberalism, like America and Italy, is not just how they operate, but the tendency for populism, when given the excuse or the opportunity to drift towards authoritarianism. And while the alternatives to the liberal democratic system grow more confident, the citizens living in those systems become ever more restless. Politicians and political institutions in countries are viewed with dismay and contempt. We don't like them, we don't trust them, we don't think they can solve the problems that most matter to us. And the evidence, particularly from the US, but spreading, is starting to suggest that disillusionment with politics is now turning into indifference towards democracy itself. So will liberal, liberal democracy come back into fashion? Is this a cycle or is it a trend? Behind the global patterns, each country is different, but reflect for a moment on what is driving anger and disillusionment in our own. Living standards flatlining for longer than at any time since the Industrial Revolution. A decade of austerity leaving our public services threadbare and in a mode of continual crisis management. 
from social care to gangs, from cybercrime to mental health, how many of us think government is facing up to problems, let alone developing solutions? Inequality, having risen precipitously in the 1980s, remained stubbornly high, fueling anger about elites and making not just the economic divide, but all divisions worse. Social media, where increasingly people get their information and engage in political discourse, has the seemingly inbuilt tendency to confirm prejudice and polarise opinion. The great intertwined forces shaping the future, globalisation, unprecedented corporate power, technological change, continue to reinforce a sense in people, places and nations that they have no agency. And yet, the hunger to take back control, which started as tragedy, is rapidly becoming a farce. If this is the warm climate in which disillusionment has taken root and grown, it shows few signs of cooling. Now, for all its many failings, I have always believed that over the long term, liberal democracy would carry on making lives better for most people most of the time. As a progressive, my guiding star is what Roberto Unger has called the larger life for all. But for the first time, for the first time, I view the future with more fear than hope. Now, there are those who disparage pessimism. To them, the backlash against liberalism, the signs of declining faith in democracy, are passing responses to failure and misfortune. Populism will give the system the wake-up call it needs. In time, a new generation of leaders will renew the system. Populism need neither be extreme nor beget authoritarianism. Look at Macron. But this underestimates the dangers that face us. It's too reminiscent of those who believed until the results came in that the British people would not take the risk of Brexit or that the Americans would reject the madness of Trump. It underestimates, too, how the turn against liberal democracy in one country can beget it in another. Paradoxically, today, nationalists seem more able to collaborate with each other than our countries ostensibly committed to internationalism. Chaos spreads more quickly than order. Global treaties and institutions that take years to agree can break down overnight. Now, of course, liberal democracy has failed over and again to live up to its own purpose. But the fact that things need to change doesn't mean that they couldn't get a whole lot worse. We're also in danger of underestimating the coherence and confidence of liberal liberalism's critics. Last month, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban made a powerful speech defending his brand of nationalist populism and boasting of his growing alliances across Europe. He appealed to the continent's centre-right to recognise it has more in common with conservative nationalism than the EU's liberal establishment. There are aspects of Orban's analysis which have an understandable appeal to the mainstream, but remember, this is also a man who is unashamedly hostile to Islam, contemptuous of humanitarianism, and who is playing fast and loose with democratic safeguards in his own country. So we may disagree about how malign or dangerous are figures like Orban or Erdogan or Trump or Salvini, but surely we can agree that those who want to defend the open, pluralistic, inclusive values of liberal democracy must try to make a better case for what we believe. In part, this involves defending the record of liberal societies in improving lives, creating opportunities and keeping the peace, at least between themselves. But it also means facing up to what is going wrong and what must change. Now, I should say this is the 12th annual lecture I've done, and so before I spoke tonight, I checked out where this puts me in terms of long-running West End shows. Um, <laughs> apparently, I'm just ahead of Wicked, but long way behind Mamma Mia. So the dark and scary part of my speech is over. Now I hope to give you something to sing along with. <laughs> Complex problems are rarely addressed with simple solutions. To ever again achieve the remarkable and unprecedented economic and social advances of the three decades after the Second World War, liberal democracy needs profound renewal. But change must start someplace. And this evening, I want to argue that that place should be the way we do democracy itself. The idea that our democracy and the norms, institutions and processes that comprise it are in need of reform is hardly new. Doughty campaigners have been calling for years for democratic changes such as electoral reform, reconstituting the House of Lords, state funding of political parties. 
but their arguments have rarely reached far beyond the folk interested in that kind of thing. But there have, in my lifetime, been two concerted attempts by civil society institutions to move democratic renewal centre stage. The first was in the Charter 88 initiative. This is best remembered as a response to both Labour's crushing defeat in the 1987 general election and the centralising tendencies of the Thatcher governments. For a short period, Charter 88 and its demands dominated coverage in the 1992 general election. Indeed, some people believe it contributed to Neil Kinnock's defeat by implying a Labour government will be distracted by constitutional reform. Then, in the wake of the disastrous general election turnout of 2001, the power inquiry was established. The inquiry was well-funded, reasonably high-profile, but it, too, achieved little traction after its final report in 2006. The characteristic that both these initiatives had in common was their ambition. Charter 88 had 10 concrete demands ranging from proportional representation and a reformed judiciary to devolution and freedom of information. And some of its demands have been enacted, but few of its authors would say that today's democracy embodies their vision. The power inquiry was even more extensive, with 30 recommendations ranging from electoral reform to citizenship education, but it its call for radical change, too, fell on deaf ears. Now, the aim of these initiatives to design a whole new political system was intellectually commendable. In hindsight, it was also tactically ill-advised. The more demands a campaign makes, the greater the danger of alienating people. There's no doubt a correlation between people who want more devolution to cities and elected lords and PR, but it isn't absolute. Also, opponents of reform can credibly argue that any government pursuing such a broad agenda would have little time for the kinds of things most people care about much more, like improving public services or growing the economy. We love big ideas here at the RSA, but we're also obsessed with change, not just where we want to go, but how to start the journey. Our analysis has led us to a strategy we call thinking like a system and acting like an entrepreneur. To renew our democracy, we need system change. But acting entrepreneurially means focusing not only on what we want, but where change may now be most possible. With little political muscle at our disposal, the best route to reform is not to set about the whole edifice, but to search for a loose brick. This is the thinking behind the campaign we hope to pursue with our partners from Involve. It's why I'm not proposing the kind of root and branch reform programme of Charter 88 and the Power Inquiry. Instead, our core demand is simple and modest. Every year, the government should sponsor three national deliberative processes on topics chosen respectively by government, by parliament and by the public. To make sure these processes are seen to have impact, ministers should be required to respond in full to the citizens' deliberation, outlining to parliament the government's response to its recommendations. Through these initial small steps, Robust citizen deliberation could in time become an integral part of our unwritten constitution. So why is the greater use of deliberative democratic methods the best starting point? Well, first, deliberative processes directly address two of the most fundamental problems with our representative system. I believe these are problems which we were perhaps willing to overlook when politics was more class-based, when citizens were more optimistic, when we had lower expectations of choice in the rest of our lives. But now these flaws are unacceptable. First, representative democracy provides an incredibly blunt mandate. Every five years, a government is elected with the support of less than a third of the population on the basis of a take-it-or-leave-it manifesto containing hundreds of policies. Then, in power, Governments have to respond to a whole new set of issues. Generally, we prefer shopping to politics. But imagine what we would think of supermarkets if we had to elect a single brand every five years. And then we were not only compelled to use that store, but it could decide what to put in our shopping basket and how much it wanted to charge for it. Second, the tragic irony of our system is that as soon as someone becomes a formal representative, we are inclined to believe that this person is no longer a representative of us as ordinary citizens. I know this myself. I was a politician many, many years ago, uh, a local councillor. I remember one day a public meeting in Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, and I wasn't very popular in the meeting, it has to be said. And at the end, a, a very posh guy came up to me and he said to me, he said, it's absolutely disgraceful. And I said, well, what is? And he said, well, what you're wearing. Um, <laughs> because I wasn't wearing a suit and I wasn't wearing a, a, a tie. He said, it's appalling. And I said to him, look, I said, I'm, 
I'm, I'm wearing ordinary clothes. I said, I'm, I'm just an, I'm an ordinary person. He looked me right in the eye and he said, yes, he said, I'm rather afraid you are. Um, <laughs> so you can't get it right if you're a politician. But although public perceptions of politicians, and many of my best friends are politicians, may seem harsh, there is some truth in that public view that when a politician becomes elected, they cease to be an ordinary representative citizen. And that's true for one particular reason. Generally, politicians, and certainly those with any ambition, are in their day-to-day -day dealings much more beholden to their parties than to the electorate. Yet in terms of values, habits, and makeup, political parties are highly unrepresentative of the public at large. Democratic deliberation addresses both these flaws head on. First, it can help to provide a direct mandate, not only strengthening accountability, but legitimising the kind of difficult choices that politicians generally try hard to avoid. Issues ranging from drug regulation to road pricing, from the ethics of AI to social care funding, the last of which was recently the subject of a very successful deliberative process designed by Involve on behalf of two select committees. Second, by bringing the views of ordinary citizens to the heart of policymaking, it addresses that problem of representation. Citizens' juries, like legal juries, one of our few historical institutions that have not come under sustained reputational attack, citizens' juries rely on a simple and powerful assumption by the public, namely, if I had heard the same evidence, I would have reached the same conclusions. There are other reasons, too. We can show these methods already work all around the world, something I'm sure Tim and Claude will want to underline. Taking deliberation seriously in the UK, it's not, it's not a leap into the unknown. It's finally catching up with what other countries and cities have already shown to work. And also, there's no reason why deliberation should be an issue that divides us ideologically. Unlike other constitutional questions like electoral reform or party funding, few people have a fixed view. In the last few weeks, as my obsession with the subject has grown, I like to think I've convinced both some Labour and some Conservative supporters to take deliberation more seriously. And also, in contrast to other democratic reforms, our proposals are easy to enact. I would like to see deliberation set in law, but the first few rounds of juries could start now without any legislation. Deliberation also connects democracy to people's day-to-day -day concerns. Often, democratic reform can feel obscure and irrelevant. The low turnout in the 2011 referendum on electoral reform can be explained by the absence of the kind of groundswell of support that citizen deliberation can build, but also because it seemed irrelevant to the issues people care about most. In contrast, deliberation is never just about the process, but also always about the substantive issue that's being explored. It connects better process to better outcomes. And deliberation is also a gateway reform. Once the role of citizens' juries is accepted, they are the perfect forum to frame and advance the debate for other constitutional changes, just as has happened in Ireland. At the moment, deliberation is not widely understood or accepted. And that isn't only true of the layperson. We recently hosted a speech by the Leader of the House, currently presiding over National Democracy Week. In questioning, it became painfully clear that she didn't even know what democratic deliberation meant. The proposals I'm making tonight can help us develop a deliberative habit, habit, and the evidence suggests that once we have that habit, we won't want to give it up. In the face of populism, public disenchantment with politics and policy failure, dem democratic deliberation is a modest answer. But whatever ideals we might ultimately aspire to for our democracy, it's not hope that leads to action as much as action that leads to hope. Rather than giving in to despair or marching towards another heroic failure, let's aim for something achievable, something that could give us the confidence and the means to build a liberal democracy fit for our turbulent times. Thank you. We're joined by our two discussants. I won't introduce them again, but I will let them do their bit. So when Clodagh's had a chance to sit down, <laughs> I will ask Clodagh to start. Um, 
Uh, thank you. Thank you um, for the invitation to be here. It's, it's a privilege and an honour to be sitting in this wonderful um, building of this wonderful society. Um, I suppose it's funny, I was listening to your speech there, uh, Matthew, and the points that I had prepared in advance I decided to put to one side and to deal a little bit with this idea of dull and puny, and it's very understandable why some might, you know, um, describe deliberative democracy as dull and puny. I suppose let's deal with puny. Deliberative processes, by and large, in the past have been ad hoc, um, kind of once-off one, events, um, and we don't always see impact from them. So people might say, oh, they're talking shops, what has been achieved by this? I'm playing devil's advocate here. I am here as a passionate defender of deliberative <laughs> democracy. And secondly, dull. Well, I suppose politics is the art of compromise. So most of the problems that we face today in modern society are complex. They're very new. The challenges are very new to us, whether it's cybersecurity, terrorism, the form of terrorism we face today, whether it's climate change, etc. These are all things that require messy, complicated solutions. They rely, 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 require us, excuse me, to sit down and consider a lot of evidence, but not just kind of facts, but also maybe perspectives of others, the lived experience, and to come to compromises. And that can be dull. It is time consuming. consuming. It is onerous on us. Um, and that doesn't necessarily make it sexy from a media perspective or indeed lead to nice headlines. It's easier to say, you know, X is fighting with Y on A and B. Um, so yes, it can, it can be dull, but that is not to say that it is not vitally important and indeed can be at times extremely exciting and extremely, I suppose, mobilising and life um, enforcing. And I suppose I say that as somebody who has come to you today from, from Ireland, from Cork, where a little, a little over five weeks ago we truly had a historic referendum and I think most of us probably cried in the days up to it and in the day of the vote and indeed as the results came out because it was a very emotional time. It was a time of, I suppose, great great success um, for, for deliberative processes. I'm not going to necessarily speak much about the issue, but in an Irish context, and those of you who might know Ireland will know that traditionally we have been quite socially conservative, but we underwent a deliberative process that um, Went, went through a whole system. I suppose, for a start, it was at a citizens' assembly that was sponsored by the government. It consisted of 99 randomly selected citizens that were broadly reflective of geography, sex, age, and socioeconomic status. And they met. They were charged to look at a number of topics, but the most contentious one they were asked to look at was repeal of um, an amendment that was made to our constitution in 1983 that gave, gave equal right to the life of the unborn child and the mother. I won't get into the legal issues, I'm not a legal expert. But it suffice to say that five weekends, these people, ordinary citizens from all over the island, gave five weekends of their lives to discussing this topic. And they didn't just bring in the legal and medical experts, they also asked for a weekend of, and they also had stakeholders from various groups, so whether they're the church organisations or um, you know, uh, women's organisations and those championing equality rights, etc. But they also asked for a weekend to be given to the testimonies of those who had experience on this issue, women who had um, either, for a variety of reasons, either chose to terminate a pregnancy or were faced in difficult situations and chose not to. And um, so they're bringing all these perspectives and the facts on board, they came to a series of recommendations. And their recommendations were, were, were quite radical at the time. Um, interestingly enough, many of them are what went through with the same level of support in the referendum. And there were those who said, no, this is far too radical, Ireland is not ready for this. But what was interesting about this process, and I think this is why sometimes People might be critical and say things like, and dismissive and say, oh, this is dull and puny or, you know, ridiculous, because sometimes they might feel threatened. Those who are currently in power may feel threatened by these processes. And the one thing, I suppose, that I have learned um, in recent times, because I've been also involved in other processes in Ireland and elsewhere, is that nobody advocates that deliberative democracy replace what we already have. It is to work in tandem, it is to complement. So if you look at the Irish example, just the most recent one, I could go back a few years and look at marriage equality too, and you will see that there are sim similarities or there are parallels. But firstly, the topic, the topic came on the agenda as a result of a 
a kind of a grassroots movement, the repeal the Eighth. It, this was the Eighth Amendment that had made this change to our constitution. So the repeal the Eighth movement had, had I suppose, harnessed people from civil society, from the, the broader public, and had pushed and pushed for this topic to be on kind of on the agenda, and had put pressure on political parties in particular to tackle it. So you can see a role there for participatory democracy. The political representatives. I suppose responded by saying, right, one of the ways we can deal with this is by setting up a citizens' assembly to tackle it. Now, it is interesting, we have currently a minority government that is kind of in a support, a supply and support agreement with usually, it's what has been traditionally its bitter rival. Um, and I think what happened with the governing party uh, at the current time was uh, that they felt that it would be too internally divisive for them to go initiate a referendum or indeed initiate legislation on this. What might be actually more politically astute would be to pass this over to another group. Um, however, um, they committed to following up on the recommendations and when they set up the assembly, they said, yes, whatever comes from this assembly needs to come back to parliament for discussion and to government. So what we saw was when the assembly produced their report and they presented it to parliament, we had a, a, a joint eructus, so a joint parliamentary committee, our parliamentary joint committee set up to discuss it, to make recommendations. It supported by and large the recommendations that had some, um, some kind of small legal changes. And interestingly enough, the government decided to run, run with the referendum and they actually went with what the assembly had recommended. And then it was put to a vote of the people in a referendum. So you had a role there for participatory, deliberative, representative and direct democracy. Um, and uh, I suppose the reason I'm telling you this is to show that it, it is not to take from the powers of one group to set up such a process. And in fact, what these kind of systems can do, if this kind of institutional approach of embedding deliberative mini-publics, as is proposed by Matthew, can do, is it can address some of the shortcomings that we find in each of the democratic forms and models that we have in society. And it certainly I would very much support and welcome any call to institutionalise deliberative processes because that is not what we have had in Ireland. It has been, they have been kind of created at the behest of government. But I think anything that is regular, that is coupled or linked into decision making processes and has the possibility to have an impact is, is to be welcomed. Tim. Great. Thank you very much. And th first of all, thank you to, to Matthew for sharing the stage for his, uh, his big annual lecture with us. Um, as we've heard from Matthew, democracy is not working as it should. Decision makers are struggling to get things done. Uh, people are fr frustrated that the decision isn't working for them. And everyone is feeling divided, distrustful and powerless. And if we look at these statistics, uh, if we look at the Hansard's uh, regular uh, annual uh, look at political engagement, it makes for some quite troubling reading. So only 29% of people are satisfied with the current system of government in the UK at the moment. And only 34% of people think that if they, can, if they get involved, that they can make a difference. So quite simply, um, if things don't change, then people's lives are going to get worse and uh, democracy as we know it is under threat. Uh, but things can be different and at Involve we see our role as uh, demonstrating how uh, democracy can work uh, for everyone. And so for those who don't know us, uh, Involve is the UK's uh, leading public participation charity. Uh, we have a mission to put people at the heart of decision making. And we were founded in 2003 uh, to create a new focus for the thinking and action around how new forms of public participation can fit with our existing democratic institutions. So what we're really interested in is democracy beyond the ballot box and specifically how the, the principles and values around greater participation and greater deliberation can play a much larger role within our politics and within our democracy. And the message I want to leave you with today, as I hope Matthew already has and Cloda uh, will have as well, is that this is entirely possible and also that it's happening. Uh, 
And just to give you a few examples, so we've heard of the fantastic example already from Ireland, uh, where the Citizen Assembly there has dealt with some really uh, important and uh, kind of nationally significant topics that uh, kind of go from the, the social issues around abortion and same-sex marriage uh, to issues around the environment and uh, a whole host of other kind of political constitutional issues as well. If we look to Canada and Australia, we see fantastic examples of deliberation happening at a very kind of local or regional level on topics from planning to healthcare uh, to where a nuclear power station should be, uh, uh, should be put. Uh, if we look in Mongolia, we see examples of them using uh, deliberative polling to, uh, to reshape their constitution. If we look to South Korea, we see examples of them actually basing their nuclear energy policy now around the outcome of a deliberative poll. And if we look to the US and the states of Oregon, uh, we see the processes that they use with groups of about 24 citizens who review the, um, the ballots that are put to people through referendums before it goes out to a referendum. And they provide impartial advice and evidence to the to uh, citizens within Oregon on, on, uh, on the topic at hand. And it's been proven there that that makes a difference to how people then vote in the, in the referendum. So this is entirely possible. It's happening around the world. In the UK, we have been lagging behind, as, as Matthew has said. Um, but we have made some important progress, and some important progress very recently. And so over the past few months, uh, my organisation involved has been working with two parliamentary committees uh, to establish a citizen assembly on social care. And like many other important issues from climate change to pensions to housing, uh, politicians have failed over a number of decades now to find a, a political consensus and a set of proposals that will work to, to sustainably fund social care in the future. And this has left social care at the point of crisis, and some, uh, some people would say in crisis currently. And it's also left, I think, a general sense that the political system can't work to solve these big issues, and also that politicians are ducking the issue, as Matthew has already said. So we worked with Parliament to establish a citizen assembly, which brought together a representative group of 47 uh, citizens from across England, who were representative of the, of the English population according to age, gender, ethnicity, the region of the country they came from, their socioeconomic status, and then also what they, uh, their opinion on whether we should have kind of a larger or a smaller state, so essentially whether we should tax people more or less. And we've got a short video to give you a quick introduction to that. The Citizens' Assembly on Social Care is a group of 47 representative citizens from across England who are coming together over two weekends to consider how adult social care should be funded in England in the future. The thing I found most surprising is that such a diverse group of people could be so engaged and so respectful towards one another on what is quite an emotive subject. I think this is a really interesting way forward. It's been absolutely fascinating being here today and watching how this is operating and how engaged uh, people are. Events like these are important because it keeps the focus on what the issues are. Um, it refocuses the attention on where it needs to be. Issues in societies needs to be addressed and the government needs to know what people or general population feel about the different issues. Citizens' Assembly give us uh, another way, a, a way of getting a very considered view from a cross-section of the public. So I think it's something that's going to prove very useful on this occasion and will be an example for other select committees in the future as well. I felt privileged to be actually invited to take part in this Citizens' Panel and I do feel that in the end it is really going to be worthwhile. So over the course of two weekends, the, the 47 uh, citizens who are members of the Assembly 
took part in 28 hours of deliberation each, which totals about 1,300 hours of deliberation uh, collectively. And they came up with a set of really kind of bold, uh, clear and coherent uh, policy recommendations for government on how to fund social care sustainably in the future. Uh, it was a little bit of history that this happened at all. It's the first time that a citizen assembly or a similar method has been commissioned by, um, by the Houses of Parliament. Uh, but they went one step further, and kind of a really important step further, in actually the, uh, the report from the inquiry itself echoes many of the uh, recommendations put forward by the citizen assembly. And uh, Clive Betts, who we saw in the video, who's the, the chair of the Housing Communities and Local Government Select Committee, when he introduced the uh, HIDS and the uh, uh, Health and Social Care Committees, their joint report onto the, uh, onto the, uh, house, onto the floor of the House of Commons uh, last week, uh, he spoke very passionately about the role that the Citizen Assembly uh, played in, in shaping what their, what their committees have recommended. So that's important progress, but it's not enough. Uh, deliberation, the value of it, and also the specific processes needs to become a defining principle of how our democracy and how our politics works. Uh, but it also needs to be high quality deliberation. So it needs to be properly resourced, it needs to be focused where it makes a difference, and it needs to really hand over power to citizens to, to shape uh, their recommendations. And so that's why we're really pleased to be working with the RSA. And we invite you to, to sign up uh, to the, the campaign that we're starting together. Uh, and I think on the screen you should see the, the details of, of the pledge. So if you visit the, uh, the web address, you will find uh, the details and find a place to sign up. Uh, but we invite you to sign up if you agree with the statements that democracy is in peril and at risk of further erosion by the forces of elitism and populism that robust forms of deliberative democracy presents an opportunity for change which strengthen representative democracy, and that you will actively encourage politicians and national and local governments to commission deliberative decision-making as a way of enhancing their work. And I believe, kind of together, we can make a real difference over the coming kind of months and years to actually really put deliberation, really put the voice of citizens at the heart of decision-making. So thank you again to, to Matthew and the RSA for helping to lead that. Okay, so we've heard a scarily compelling case from Matthew. We've heard inspiration from Clodagh along with a plea to, for any action to make things institutionalised, therefore they will happen regularly and be uh, linked to decision making. And we've heard a, another inspiration from Tim and also a kind of call to action um, that's there. So before I open to questions, I just wanted to ask you, just to energise our brain cells, just turn to your neighbour and we'll just have five minutes where you have a chance to say what struck you about what you've heard from the lecture and the, the two discussants, um, and what questions or comments are forming in your own mind, and perhaps what ideas you have for the policy areas that could so easily be put in the too difficult box or the kicked into the long grass, but if we had more deliberative processes might mean that, that politicians were more confident um, and feel that their decisions could be more legitimate because of those processes. So five minutes.
Thank you very much. I can hear masses of energy in the room. Um, you will have a chance, hopefully, to ask questions or give comments uh, if you want to. Um, what, in terms of how we manage this, then there, will be, there are roving microphones. Please wait for a microphone so everyone else can hear your, your question or comment or idea. And please do say your name and, if relevant, the organisation that you're from. And we'll probably, given the number of you, I'll take things in, in twos or threes and ask the panel to comment. But as is usual as chair, I'm going to use my chair's prerogative to ask the first question. Um, I, I have been discussing deliberative democracy for a couple of years with business, with civil society organisations and with politicians. And I have found that, in one sense, of course, civil society organisations are in favour because the kind of people I were talking to were those who would be. But the thing that really impressed me was that business are very enthusiastic about deliberation because they need to plan. And so they don't want decisions kicked into the long grass or put in the too difficult box. But the people who are most resistant are politicians. And obviously, if we're going to, as Clodagh talked about, institutionalise this so that it becomes the way we do things as a supplement and support and strengthening of representative democracy, then the politicians have got to say yes. So I guess my first question to you all is, why is there such resistance and how do you think we might overcome it? Uh, so I think the, the first thing I would say is that some of it comes from a lack of understanding of what it is. And there's a common hurdle that we find with, with politicians that this isn't just uh, a bunch of people who have just turned up in a room to, to talk in a very unstructured way about a topic. Uh, this is a robust methodology. The, uh, the citizens who are chosen are representative of the broader population. There's kind of a whole robust method to, to doing that. But then also the design of the process itself is set up to ensure that everybody can participate, uh, that you get to some kind of clear outcomes and uh, there's kind of a good quality of deliberation. So I think some of it's kind of um, uh, getting, pe uh, getting politicians and other people indeed to, to understand exactly what these processes are, which can sound kind of quite abstract, I think is, is part of the solution. I think the other part is to get beyond them seeing it as, a, as kind of competing with their role as decision maker. And as we've heard today, um, the, the vast majority of these processes are set up to inform decision makers. They're set up as a way to give decision makers a really good understanding of what an informed set, uh, a group of the public thinks about an issue when they've had the chance to, to learn about it and deliberate. Uh, but also allows them to, to kind of open up options that perhaps weren't uh, politically feasible for whatever reason in the past. It kind of can help them to give that kind of extra level of legitimacy from the public to make the, the difficult decisions. So I think those two things in concert are, the, uh, are key to kind of making the case. Um, yeah, I mean, it's perfectly natural that they're sceptical of it, really. I mean, if I were a politician and I had served my time on my local council and had taken the shoe leather out onto the streets to canvas and run up to the, run up to the elections and, you know, faced sometimes defeat before I eventually got a seat, I would be hesitant of thinking, well, this is somebody who's been randomly selected and what do they know and what have they learned at the School of Hard Knocks, etc.? Um, and I think to follow on what, from what Tim was saying, I think yes, they need to absolutely they need to be brought along and kind of in terms of understanding of what the process is. Because I thought it was very interesting to hear that many um, eminent politicians do not really understand what is meant by deliberative democracy. I think what worked well in the Irish context, and this was, in a way, it was a, it was a, one of those messy compromises that I alluded to earlier. Prior to the Citizens' Assembly that we had from 2016 to March of this year, we had, um, I suppose, its precursor in the form of the Convention on the Constitution, which kind of ran from 20, December 2012 to 2014. And it emerged kind of from a, 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 a kind of a programme for government between two coalition par parties, one which had called for a Citizens' Assembly, which was all citizens on political reform, and the other one, which was the Labour Party, had called for more Convention on the constitutional and more traditional format that blended citizens, civil society and political representatives. So what we got in the end was a compromise which was two-thirds randomly selected citizens and one-third political representatives, roughly in proportion to their size in the, the, the doll, which is our lower house of parliament, and indeed included some politicians as well from Northern Ireland. All were invited to join. 
not all, I suppose, were interested in joining. And it was the forum that looked at, well, there were many issues it looked at, but it looked at, I suppose, same-sex marriage or marriage equality. And I suppose that was the first referendum to come out of one of these processes um, to successfully pass worldwide. Um, now, what was very interesting, those of us who are keen advocates of deliberative democracy had been looking a lot to what was happening in Canada, as mentioned earlier by Tim, and we said, oh no, including political representatives, this is a really, this is a poor, poor idea. Um, you know, politicians, even, though, even if they're in the minority, are potentially going to hijack this. They're more accustomed to debating with one another. They're more accustomed to having their voices heard. It's going to mean that some voices are not heard. Um, we were wrong, so um, it's not often academics admit that, but we were, and in fact the politicians came on board from all the political parties in Ireland and um, allowed the citizens to speak. Naturally the politicians spoke too, but what was very interesting to come back to the point was it, I suppose, it gave all obviously not every politician was present but those who were from their political parties brought it back to their parties they also spoke about it on the floor of parliament when the reports were presented to parliament and spoke glowingly of it even those who might have been skeptical going into it even those who might have been upset at times with some of the recommendations there were some exceptions um, to this, uh, literally one, I think, as far as I can remember, one exception to that rule. Um, uh, uh, but um, by, so bringing the politicians along in that way certainly served the process well, and it was replicated then in the assembly. And I think that that certainly helped to embed it in that way, or the understanding of it. And exceptions. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start over here and take two or three from here. The gentleman at the back in a blue shirt, and then the the guy in the Czech and the guy in the red shirt here. Yes, thank you. My name is David Sammons. I stood as an independent at the 2010 general election because I think democracy needs major change. Is this not just a sticking plaster to a political system and parliamentary system that's outmoded, out of date and broken? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll take yes, the gentleman in the Czech shirt there. Two, two very quick questions. Um, the, the Irish examples are essentially non-political issues. They were both issues of personal conscience and therefore the sort of subject which politicians understandably are uh, hesitant to, to tackle and where given that it's about each and personal, how they feel about these rather very personal things, non-party non political, certainly, um, that uh, so it makes it rather special and appropriate for a referendum, whereas generally, I think referendums are a disaster. And my second question is, what is the difference in the question of the example you've had about social care? What is the difference between this consultative Democratic Assembly and focus groups, informed polling over time, um, all the myriad ways in which, where through the internet or voting, or um, you can actually get a, a view to inform, to help the decision makers understand how people feel about these questions. Thank you. And the gentleman at the front in the red shirt. Hi, um, my name is Andrew. I work for an organization called National Voices. It's a coalition of health and care charities. Um, mine's a suggestion that I'd welcome your reflections on. Um, so really interesting to hear what you're talking about, and particularly when you were talking about this being great, this model being good for thorny issues. So Theresa May has just committed to giving more money to the National Health Service, and interestingly with it has then tasked the NHS, or NHS England specifically, to come up with a 10-year plan for how it should be spent and what should change. Um, would the RSA at the start of this campaign be willing to... Um, uh, offer slash put pressure on NHS England to adopt this approach and to work with them to, uh, to come up with that plan, not just with doctors and officials, but with the public. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, just pick uh, up anyone that you want. As quick as I possibly can. Um, uh, I don't think it is a sticking plaster. As I said in my speech, uh, I think it's a gateway reform in the sense that once we get the habit of deliberation, then the other issues, the other concerns that you've got about the electoral system or party funding or whatever, those issues can then be debated. But you need to start somewhere. 
And this, I think, is a, a great way of starting to open up those issues. And as Arlen demonstrated, it's good for looking at constitutional reforms. I mean, whether or not an issue is defined as political, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't think that's a fixed thing. You know, a party says, well, we're supporting this. Another party says, well, we don't support it. So if you look at social care funding, for example, the idea that there might be some kind of tax on people's estates, there's nothing inherently political about that. But the second the Labour Party said it was their idea, then it was a very political idea. But I think there's a whole number of issues. Road pricing, drug regulation I talked about, you know, new issues like AI. There's all sorts of questions that I think you can look at. And also, you can look at issues like how you distribute budgets. So these processes have been used very effectively, particularly at the local level, to say, how should we spend money most effectively between different kinds of priorities? So I think they do have that kind of, uh, that kind of wider um, value. And the final thing was, on the NHS, it's worth saying that these methods are used by other organisations in civil society. It's just Parliament and Westminster that's particularly averse to it. So, for example, NICE has got a panel, actually Institute of Clinical Excellence has got a panel which it's used for many years to advise it on spending on uh, treatments for very expensive treatments for very rare conditions, for example. So you will find some of these innovations in civil society. It's just that they don't permeate up into the top. Before I um, ask you, I wanted to come back on that one, because I think for me, one of the things about deliberative democracy is it's about our democratic process and therefore involving political decision making and at the moment government has given away uh, NHS decision making to NHS England. So I, I, I would certainly feel that, exactly as Matthew said, you might use those methods, but not necessarily treat it as part of deliberative democracy per se. Also, but sorry, the, the, the difference with online polling and all of that, it's, it's yes. enormous. The process of deliberation nearly always leads people to change the view they started with. The vast majority of the things you talk about are simply about people stating their opinion, and indeed many of those forums actually lead them to strength. I have lost count the number of people who've, who've over the years said to me, I'm going to create a space on the internet where people who disagree with each other can come together. Did <laughs> <laughs> either do you want to add anything to those questions? Um, just very, very, very briefly, in the Irish context, they didn't just, I suppose the two successful referendums I mentioned were linked to issues of personal conscience. They also debated, the Convention on the Constitution debated electoral reform um, they um, actually decided that they were happy with what we had. We also had a referendum on reducing the age at which a person could run for president. It was unsuccessful. So it actually dealt with a lot of different types of issues. <laughs> and then just finally, just in terms of the sticking plaster and the focus group issue, it's a different way of doing politics, and in particular this idea of a considered view and a view um, taking time to kind of inform oneself, listen to other perspectives, listen to, to other information, but also primarily, arguably, to be fact regarding, future regarding and other regarding. And I don't think we can say about the system that the current political system is at the moment. I'm going to move over here now and get some more questions over here and, and, and then to, to the middle. We've got about three minutes, so we're going to have to be very tight. So I want ah, the lady there in the, the blue, um, the gentleman right at the back um, and the gentleman in the uh, yellow jacket. Hello, my name is Maggie Dunn. Uh, I'm a fellow. Uh, some years ago, I was the specialist advisor on the Health Select Committee, and it would have been wonderful if we had had a system um, of um, people who were formed an assembly. Because one of the things you had on the Select Committee was people giving evidence, and of course, the evidence they were giving was defending their own position. Um, so they all came along and they all told their version of the truth or uh, told lies. And the select committee was left having to work their way, way through the evidence that had been presented. Now, if there had been such a thing as a people's assembly who were able to advise and help the select committee, I think some of the um, conclusions reached and some of the recommendations made would have been much more robust and much more accessible. So if we were to start in a small way with something like the select committees um, and to show how robust the, the process is and how helpful it could be, then perhaps we get rid of opposition. I think to suggest that we go down the road of lots and lots of um, referendums some people might uh, not find so attractive. Actually, I'm going to say apologies to the gentleman in the yellow because we're just not going to have time. I want to make sure I get someone for the middle. So, um, gentleman right at the back with a beard. Hello. Yeah. Um, you started off by talking about the, um, the crisis of liberal democracy and the decoupling of liberalism and democracy. Um, I wonder what happens when greater deliberation and participation 
leads in illiberal directions? Or do you think that deliberation done well will always lead in liberal directions? Very good. And then I'm going to take one from here, um, um, Julian in the middle there in the blue shirt. Sorry, we're just running out of time. Uh, thank you. Julian McRae from the Institute for Government. Very briefly, I'm a big fan of deliberative uh, discussion. If you think about representative democracy, it has a really great tagline of one person, one vote. It encapsulates ideas of equality of process, etc. What will be your equivalent tagline for deliberative democracy? <laughs> Difficult question. Okay. <laughs> you wanted to go for the one uh, at the back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, there are certain things that tend to happen in citizens' juries. It's, it's true. And uh, if you talk about criminal justice, people tend to go in as Daily Mail readers and come out as Guardian readers because, <laughs> because they, they look at the evidence and it, it moves their instincts. People have instincts. The other thing that's interesting, which is more hopeful if you're, I guess, from a writer's centre perspective, is that people tend to go in saying it's the government's fault and come out saying, no, actually, citizens have got a responsibility here. This is about us as well. So I think, you know, there, there are things which go in different directions. And, and generally, it doesn't even, it never reaches a kind of single conclusion. It reaches, it says, well, this is the broad direction, but you need to remember this and this and this. So even if it was, for example, to suggest a liberal view on immigration, it would also say, but these are issues that you need to address. So it's never uh, simple uh, like, like, like that. Um, I, the first point... I'm, be really brief, but it's really important. The structure of political debate, the overwhelming structure of political debate is this. I believe in fairness, Clodagh believes in unfairness. To which Clodagh replies, no, I believe in fairness, Matthew believes in unfairness. And that is the vast majority of political debate. It is about people caricaturing each other's position. In citizens' jury process, you're not allowed to do that. The preparatory work means that people come along and talk about what they believe, and they're not allowed to caricature each other. I cannot tell you how much wasted time is spent on people misrepresenting each other rather than saying, you know, making the best case they can for themselves. And as for a slogan, I actually made a T-shirt for tonight, <laughs> and I was going to wear it. But the great thing about having young staff is that they help you to distinguish the line between self-promotion and humiliation. And... Uh, 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 it, it said on it, uh, for the people, by the people. <laughs> Very good. Um, did either of you wanted to pick up on any of those three comments? I certainly couldn't bet at that tagline, so... <laughs> <laughs> what was your phrase before, though? I like that fact. Oh, sorry, this is actually taken from Offa and Prius. Um, so, fact regarding, future regarding, and other regarding. And I think, yeah... That's potentially a very good tagline too, but we'd have to make sure we cited the academics. <laughs> okay. um, I can see from the hands that were going up that we uh, could have gone on well, well beyond seven o'clock and we have gone on a couple of minutes beyond. But we can carry on the conversation downstairs in the Benjamin Franklin room with, with drinks. There are two final things that I wanted to say. One is, uh, Matthew said, aim for something achievable and you as RSA friends and fellows can be part of achieving that. So if you agree with the problem, the potential solution, Solutions and that you can do something about it, please do sign up. Imagine one day if you bumped into the person you were chatting to earlier in 20 years' time and one of you was able to say, I've just done my, my stint on a citizen's jury. That's what we're aiming for long term. And the final thing was, could you join me in thanking our three, uh, well, Matthew for his lecture and to Clodagh and Tim for giving us a terrific discussion. Thank you. Thank you.